Hello and welcome everybody. We're very excited to host this webinar to support you in the Biomimicry Youth Design Challenge. My name is Gretchen Hooker and I'm the program manager for the challenge and joining me to facilitate this session is Laura Arndt, uh, founding director of Global Green STEM, um, a consultant and our lead author for the challenge curriculum. Also on the call with me today is my colleague Rosanna Ayers, uh, director of youth education here at the Biomimicry Institute. Rosanna, do you want to Give everyone a wave. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm doing it uh, virtually. I'll have to imagine it. Um, it's nice to uh, hear everyone out there. I'm very excited about uh, seeing all you engage with this session. And of course, with Gretchen and Laura and the expertise that they bring to it. So really excited about this session. Well, thanks, Rosanna. So the Biomimicry Youth Design Challenge, or as we call it, the YDC, is the Biomimicry Institute's flagship program for youth education was designed for students in middle and high school. And this free program provides educators with a framework and curriculum to introduce biomimicry through an engaging project-based STEM learning experience. Today's session will highlight key elements of the design process within the Youth Design Challenge curriculum and some of the resources available to you. So before we begin, I wanted to take a moment to uh, make sure everyone is able to access the resources that we'll be highlighting today. So if you haven't done so already, you may want to register on the Youth Design Challenge website um, to access all of the free resources for planning and instruction. So go to youth design, or excuse me, youth challenge at biomimicry.org um, and um, you'll be able to log in and access Access, uh, all of the curriculum um, for that we'll be talking about today and much more as well. Um, additionally, uh, to support today's session, we've created sort of a checklist for you with hyperlinked resources to all of the materials that we'll be talking about today and some guidelines and tips um, that we'll be going over, which you may want to remember as you're planning for um, instruction of the challenge. And um, I'm going to post that link in the chat for you right now. Um, we'll also be sending that out. Um, at a later date with the recording of this session. Oops, I think I sent that to all panelists, but I need to send it to all of you attendees as well. So there you go. Um, and um, in just a moment, I'll turn things over to my colleague, Laura Arndt. Um, but first we wanted to get a sense for who all is with us today. So we have a couple poll questions. Um, I'll launch those now. Um, first, we're interested in knowing um, what content and grade band those of you who are with us today teach. And we'll just give you a few moments to respond to this. You can check all that apply. They're just starting to come in. Great. Looking good. Got a wide variety. I'll, I'll pop in the link here, the link to the Youth Challenge website for those of you who might need to go there. All right, um, let's see here. The numbers are still moving, so I'll leave the poll open for 10 more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and share responses. All right, that's good to see. So we've got a real mix of middle and high school a variety of different content areas, uh, good representation from STEM and then other content areas. Um, that's great. So we, we will be talking about just ways to make sure you can diversify so it fits into all the different uh, curriculum that you are teaching. Okay, I'm gonna have one second. more. Um, yes, one more here. Where you are in the YDC process, if you started it or or if you haven't. So those of you that are familiar with it, um, you might just be having your students learn about biomimicry. Maybe they're in the investigate stage where they're trying to define the problem that has to do with climate change. Maybe they're looking at the biological models and doing some research. Uh, maybe they're already in designing. Looks like somebody is. Final presentations, probably not many of you are there yet since the deadline for submissions is, is that in April? When is the? In April, yes, April 1st. 
So plenty of time for those of you who are just getting started. No pressure. We're just kind of curious. So I'm going to end the poll now and share the results so you all can see okay. where your colleagues are at. It looks like we've got some people maybe that are working with teachers. Um, so that's Wonderful. All right. Well, thanks. This is actually um, good for you to be able to come in and uh, get started with this webinar. There is a webinar um, that uh, this is the second one. So there's another webinar that is available for you to take a look at that talks about um, the, beginning the, the design challenge. Um, and also, also, there's a note at the, um, at the bottom, you're going to see a Q&A. So we'll, we're going to have time to take questions at the end. So you're welcome to put any questions in that box so that we can uh, take a look at them. Either Gretchen might, or Roseanne might be answering them um, during the webinar, or we will uh, um, read them and, and address them at the end. Okay, so that Q&A there is there for you. All right, so getting organized. The whole point of this webinar uh, and the first one was just to help you get organized so that you feel prepared to teach this with students. So if you are a part of the first webinar, uh, we suggested that you set up a, a, a desktop folder. So if you haven't done that, then I would strongly suggest you do that. Uh, there's a checklist from the first webinar that has to do with uh, getting ready for both the motivate and investigate. So the beginning part of the, the youth design challenge. So you can access those resources and put whatever ones you want into that folder on your desktop so it's easy to access. And then we would suggest the same thing for the second one. So the, the documents that you plan on using, the handouts you plan on using, go ahead and put those on your desktops and organize them so it's easy for you to follow. We've put together an instructional approach that's unique uh, to the youth or the youth design challenge for biomimicry. So it's, we call it mimic. So it's motivate, which is dealing with uh, understanding the uh, biomimicry concepts. Investigate is where you're defining the problem. We are going to be focusing today on match and innovate. And then at the very end is the communicate piece. So what is it that you've actually learned? How do you describe it? How do you share it with others? How do you submit to the, the uh, challenge if you want to submit your, um, your projects. We're going to go ahead and go into the website here. So this is what the website looks like and you'll notice across the top you've got this menu. When you go into the gallery this is a great thing for you to be able to share with your students and we've pulled up a couple of videos that we're going to show you but these are winning entries for both middle school and high school uh, they're all anywhere from i think two to three minutes long so you're welcome to take a look at these look for ones that are in your content area so that you can share them with students at the beginning to give them an idea of what the design challenge looks like and then the majority of the time that we are going to be working today is going to be under the educator resources. So this is where you're going to be exploring. There is a section that is remote learning support. And as of March, with uh, all the COVID responsive classrooms, we have set this up and it continues to change and grow. The things I want to point out to you here a lot of you, I'm guessing if you're teachers, you are already becoming very familiar with a lot of these uh, resources. But we do have down here uh, different suggestions for how to do modeling and prototyping in a virtual environment, virtual classroom. Uh, there's also some resources for being able to have them design online if that's something that you wanna do. Uh, ideas for testing and refining their resources and certainly uh, creating a pitch, which is a part of the design challenge for them being able to um, submit. And then all of this particular session, we're gonna be focused on the instructional storyline link. So you're welcome to go into that and mess around with it if you're good at multitasking while we're, we're talking ab about the, the different sections. So the things, if you haven't uh, done this yet that you're gonna to wanna to take care of is to download this full storyline. This is where all the lessons are. So all the curriculum that we're talking about are here. If you're interested in the alignments, you've got that right up above. And then you're seeing the uh, mimic 
descriptions there for the instructional approach. And then as you keep moving down, you can uh, toggle between the different sections. Uh, we're going to be focusing on match. So this particular section here, all of these are hyperlinked out to resources that you can download or take a look at, or some of them are websites, and also innovate where they're actually doing the design. So those are the two sections that we'll be focusing on. Right. When we look at the big picture for the Youth Design Challenge, there are three big components. So the first one is uh, helping the students get an understanding of biomimicry. So we call that motivate. And uh, there's a series of lessons in there, uh, including going outside uh, for them to be able to really grasp the big understandings of what biomimicry is before they actually try to design a, uh, a solution to a problem using biomimicry. The second section is in actually identifying, defining, narrowing a sustainability problem. And for the Youth Design Challenge, the focus is on climate change. We also have as support materials, the sustainable development goals as goals for your problems that um, are related to climate change. So if you wanna explore sustainable development goals, you can take a look at some of the resources there. <clears throat> We're going to be focused today on match and innovate, which is a part of the design cycle where they're going to actually be creating a, um, an innovative solution um, using biomimicry. These are the questions that we're going to be taking a look at. Uh, the first one is uh, just reviewing what motivate and investigate do to set students up for what we're going to be focusing on today. We'll take a look at match. Uh, there's something called biologize. That's an interesting term that is very unique to biomimicry. And so we want to focus on that and, and give you some hints for how to teach that. And then we'll move into innovate. A lot of people are more familiar with innovate because that is really looking at the de de engineering design process, or we're calling it the engineering design cycle to focus on the iterative approach. So you should feel more comfortable with that. And, uh, but we'll go through some of the unique features uh, that we have when you're using biomimicry as a model for the design. And then also we're looking at how to customize for the COVID world. The instructional storyline is something that you're gonna to wanna to download. It's a, a fairly significant document with a whole series of lessons uh, and resources for you to access to give you an idea of how you would move through this logically. And you can pick and choose, but um, it, is, it is done in, in, the, in the form of a storyline so that you can start at the beginning and move all the way through the end. The storyline has an anchor question that's related to the challenge. So how can learning from nature help us solve a local sustainability problem that's connected to global climate change? So all the lessons in the storyline filter into that. So by the time they've done all the lessons, they can answer this question. They will have designed a solution to a problem that has to do with climate change. Today, our focus is a piece of that. So if we unpack it, we're gonna take out that piece for match and innovate. And the question that we're looking at is how nature can become a model, which is a, a big NGSS focus, as you know, a model for designing solutions to problems. They are aligned to the next generation science standards. Uh, I've got some highlights here on the side just to pull some things out. So up here at the top, the colors aren't showing up on my computer quite as well, but this looks a little bit yellow. The structure and function and adaptation is really the focus for um, the biological piece of the design challenge. The next pinkish red looking box here is climate change, um, global climate change and human impacts. So that's where you're gonna be identifying the problem, right? And then these two boxes that are um, blue, you've got your engineering design and you have the models, you're ex constructing explanations, you're designing solutions, you're arguing that your solution, your design is the best for being able to solve this problem. So that's looking at the um, design process. Then the other really cool thing is because climate change is so broad, uh, the design challenge can fit into any particular curriculum. So 
Well, we see that some of you are life science, some are physical science, some are earth science, some are doing engineering, um, STEM. So whatever the standards are that you're addressing in your class, you can have the students focus on a problem that's related to those concepts. And so everything that they're doing around the research piece and the designing piece is addressing um, concepts that are a part of your particular class. So let's take a look at a little bit of the background before we move into the new materials. So to see the motivate and investigate sections are setting students up for match and innovate. So again, motivate is all about exploring biomimicry. It's a new concept for a lot of students and for a lot of teachers. So how do we actually um, get them grounded in that? We're gonna have you get started and there is a jam board do you see that uh, address there? And I think Gretchen, you're gonna put that into the chat box. Um, so if you can go to this Jamboard and on it, I've got some pictures up here to inspire you, but you can use anything you want, not just the pictures here. Um, let's take a look and see if we can come up with some examples of biological models. What does that actually mean? So what you're gonna do when you go to this Jamboard, and I'll, I'll switch over to that in just a second, is you'll write down a feature for a function or a structure and function. So um, a cat has whiskers for blank. Wetlands do, um, what's the purpose of wetlands? Or a spider web, does what? Okay, so I'm going to give you about a minute and we're going to switch over. And whoop, hold it here. I'm going to go back, press the wrong button. So let's take a look at what this looks like here. There we go. Ah, I see some people in here. So as you come on, you can see webbed feet for propelling in water. Excellent. You can, you can look around your house. Maybe you've got a plant here. Maybe you've got a pet. Uh, think about what's around your house. Any kind of natural objects or items, ecosystems that you happen to live in. Go ahead and add some cards to this. If you haven't used Jamboard before, it's a really easy sticky note way of uh, gathering information with students online. Looks like some of you have, you're moving them all around. Photosynthesis, somebody write down maybe what photosynthesis is all about. I'm gonna move some of these around for you. Whoop. There we go. Excellent. So biological models and learning about structures and functions or behaviors and functions or processes and functions, um, ecosystem functions, um, that's a part of what they're gonna be learning in uh, the motivate part of the instructional approach. So this is a great review for them to be able to say, all right, so remember, how do you connect these features of an organism with the function? Excellent. So you can hold on to this link if you want to go back and refer to it in the future. So let's see what we've got. Roots for collecting water, ocean waves for energy. Tails are good for balance. Excellent. Ooh, sunflowers pointing toward the sun. Somebody finished up photosynthesis, chemical energy from sunlight, prickly surface. Ooh, I just saw that. Um, excellent, excellent, excellent. Look at all these. Okay, we're gonna cruise back into our story here. So a great way, again, of reviewing with students. Then an investigate. Investigate is where they're actually defining that problem. The thing with um, climate change is it is so huge. It's so massive. A lot of teachers are intimidated by it. Students are intimidated by it. So figuring out how to really hone it down into something that um, they can actually design a solution that addresses a narrow problem 
that is the trick. So there's, there's lots of resources in there and you can go back into the other webinar um, and the checklist to be able to access those. So we're gonna use an example. It's actually from a middle school um, entry that was a winner um, that is in our gallery so that you can see what this looks like. So if we're addressing a global problem and moving it into a, um, and then transforming it into a local problem, the broad problem that this particular team was looking at was climate change is causing more flooding in communities. Then they asked the question, well, why is this happening and how does this happen in our own communities? So they then narrowed it to more intense rainstorms are causing water to pool in streets and sidewalks downtown. So that was their beginning. They used a variety of different resources to get to that point. So we've got some listed here. Uh, the one on the far right that says problem analysis and where you have the green box, that's the final step before you move into a match, which is where we're going next. So it's creating a design question. And this is what it looks like. So if they've got their um, question that they're looking at uh, for flooding on streets, then these are the questions that then is gonna guide them into the next step toward coming up with what they want to design. Um, and it starts with how might we, okay? So how might we move water from the street or parking lot? How might we distribute water that pools on streets or parking lots? How might we build a road surface that is per water permeable? So they could have a series of these. And this is the beginning of figuring out, um, making a connection to a biomimicry model. So, which now, the next step is we move on into match. Match is very unique to biomimicry. Um, so in match, we are looking at how a design needs to function, there's the function word again, with organisms that have similar needs and abilities. So you've got a design and you've got an organism. So you're looking at, you're comparing the functions of them and the needs of both of them. And remember that it can be structures, behaviors, processes, can be a variety of things that have to do with organisms. So let's take a look at this particular um, example of this middle, these middle schoolers. Here's what I want you to be watching for. Um, what are some of the biological models they use? What are some of the materials they used? And how are they demonstrating refining and using iterative or rep repetitive design cycle? Okay, so watch for those as we listen to what they have to say. It'll get louder. The problem our team addressed is flooding in our village due to extreme weather as a result of climate change that leads to pollution, infrastructure, and habitat damage and safety risks. We walked around our village during a heavy rainfall to look at where and how water pooled on human-made surfaces. We also visited Bard College to learn about the, their poorest surface parking lot. The constraints that we were operating under included environmental, moving captured water efficiently, economic, materials cannot be expensive, social, during storm stores in our community can keep functioning. We brainstormed a number of different functions that might also prevent water from pooling or reduce water pollution, including remove, purify, capture, distribute, process, or store. We divided them up so each of us could research how nature performs these functions. We narrowed down our initial list of around 20 organisms to five and learned how to turn biological strategy into, design, into a design strategy. Using this research, we created a design solution that provides a human-made porous surface that drains, partly filters, and captures excess water which can be used in the nearby garden. From the beehive, we decided that our design surface should be made of hexagon shapes for strength. From the hot and top bread, we decided that its quirky exterior would be a permeable and strong surface to walk on. From the bromeliad and pitcher plant, we decided to mimic the way in which they use shape to channel and direct water by incorporating a funnel design into the center of the surface tiles. From the black grammar grass, we learned that the roots filter and distribute water. So the layer under our design 
would be a mat of root-like material made from recycled plastic. We are using the Hottentot again by mimicking its tubular root to absorb water for reeds. We then built two prototypes using substitute materials, including cork, sponge, and string, and coconut fibers, and then we tested to see what worked and what didn't. We made some adjustments, tried multiple times, and agreed on our final design strategy. We learned that things don't always go as planned. We need more data and experimentation, but we feel that our design could solve the problem of too much water in our courtyard. As a team, we now also understand that biomimicry is a possibility to make our world a better place. Thanks to all the advisors for helping make this a great learning experience. All right. So go ahead and write in um, the chat box, what were some of the biological models they used, materials they used? How did they demonstrate refining and the iterative design cycle? Um, in this particular one, they didn't use just one uh, organism, they used several. Sometimes students will pick just one and sometimes they might have two, this, this particular team had uh, quite a collection that they were using. The other interesting thing about uh, this team that we wanted to make sure and show you is that especially with being at home, that you can have them use uh, everyday materials, whatever they have around the house. It doesn't have to be anything complex. Uh, it doesn't have to be um, high tech on the computer, unless that's something that's a part of their class. Um, it can be very simple. Uh, we've had students that have one that simply um, have done sketches on paper, but they're very detailed and they've got great labels and explanations on them. So any kind of model that they that works for your teaching situation and your learning situation is certainly acceptable for that. And I'm not looking, I'm checking the chat box here, sorry. Um, plant roots, pitcher plants, lemongrass, ooh, beehives. Excellent. Coconut fibers. Very good. So a wide variety. This is a great um, activity to be able to do with students to get them familiar with the process. So in match, in their storyline, there are pages before each of the different sections that's getting ready. So in this case, on page 25 is where the page is for getting ready for match. And you'll notice the highlighted section there that I've got in green, it says research support. So one of the things that you wanna think about ahead of time is where you're gonna have them go and look to do research um, for the different types of biological um, the organisms to try to identify a model. So there's some examples on here. Uh, some of them are more available than others. A lot of them are going to be online at this point in time. Um, it could be that you actually do uh, some um, call in an expert to be able to come in and maybe meet with your class in, online or your team online to give some advice. Uh, and we're going to be looking at this Ask Nature site in a little bit. We've listed out some of the different things that you can do to get ready. These are also on your checklist. So all of these you can refer to and they're hyperlinked in your checklist. There is a rubric for the challenge. Uh, there's also a team assessment, which is more of a checklist. So these are there for you as the teacher to be able to look at, okay, what would this look like? What's the end product look like that you can show students so that they've got an idea of what they're going for in this particular section. So the bio biological models is the matching section. And Gretchen, I'm going to let you take over here for talking about biologizing. Yeah, thanks, Laura. So as we move into the match um, part of the learning experience for the YDC, what we're having students do is begin to relate the challenge that they identified and defined in the investigate stage and start to relate that to things that occur in nature, organisms, strategies, um, and other biological phenomenon. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a translation exercise. So you're moving from that how might we question, which is framing the problem in terms terms of a design goal or an engineering design goal. Um, and then the next step is to then um, create essentially a research question that will help you 
uh, find out how does nature do something like what we want to do so that we can then translate um, nature strategy back into a design for people. And so in the biomimicry world, we call this biologizing the design question. And so it, it's really about making that translation from how might we to how does nature. And that requires sort of returning the question around and thinking about the, the most essential functions and conditions that relate to the design problem. Um, and so you're producing um, a question, the goal is to produce a question that can logically complete the phrase, how does nature? So you wouldn't say, how does nature make an air conditioner? You would say, how does nature um, cool the body or cool um, uh, air in a space? Or um, you would complete that sentence in a way that it makes sense to ask how nature does that. And so some examples would be like, how does nature move silently through air? Owl wings um, have some really unique features that enable them to do that. Um, similarly, how does nature manage temperature in cold, wet environments? Polar bear fur is a really great example of an organism that needs to stay warm in a cold, wet environment. So it has strategies to do that. Um, or how does nature assemble hard and durable structures at low temperature? You know, the shells that um, sea creatures make are doing just that. We can go to the next slide. Um, go ahead. <laughs> oh, you're muted, Laura. <laughs> you're still muted. <laughs> sorry, sorry. One of the activities that's there is um, uh, on lesson 13 is a card game. And so if you take a look at the, um, the cards, you'll see that you can print these out. Uh, you can, if you were in a classroom, you would be able to hand them out. But in a virtual world, we have to do that a little bit differently. So I'm going to show you an option of how you could do that. So in this case, we simply did screenshots of different cards and we lined them up that students could move, you could have them move, move them around. Um, you could put it into, there's different types of, uh, of interactive websites like, um, I'm thinking of like Kahoot or uh, potentially Padlet. Uh, I'm sure there are other ones out there. Oh, that even you can... your Jamboard, probably. Oh, yeah. Yeah, to be able to move them around. You just have to build it. So take a look at these, and I'm going to give you just a, um, a little bit of time. See if you can make at least one match, one or two matches, and then I'm going to show mm -hmm. you what the answers are. And one of the sort of learning opportunities with this exercise is you're introducing this um, task of biologizing, but they get a chance to like see a problem and match it with a how does nature statement first. Um, so it can kind of help um, demystify that a little bit when they then get to their own design project and they have to come up with that how does nature research question themselves. So it's really practicing. What does this actually look like? Yeah. Oh, and we're getting some answers in the chat. Um, I see a vote for a couple of votes for D matching with number one. So yeah, compounds and carpet glues are reducing indoor air quality. How does nature stick things together? That sounds like a match to me. Um, I see a vote for three and C. So let's take a look right now. I have put the answers up. So, so take a look at uh, how you did. So identifying that problem. Now, some of these are related to climate change, which is a part of the design challenge. Some of them are not. So again, it depends on what your, your purpose is for doing this particular uh, design challenge. Um, but you'll be able to see some of these definitely could be related to uh, the climate change issue. Okay, And the cards do not have these numbers and letters on them. So I've just added those here on, um, on my PowerPoint. So many of you are very creative uh, and I'm sure could come up with really interesting ways of being able to have the students interact with this and practice putting the problem together with how does nature. So try this out. So we're going back to the problem that we just saw. So remember that one team and the video you saw it was a more intense rainstorms are causing water to pool on streets and sidewalks downtown. So the question is how might we so if you ask the question, how might we move water off of a street or parking lot? Think about what would you say? How does nature, and how would you finish that sentence? Another one, number three is, how might we build a road surface that is water permeable? Okay, so that's 
the challenge, right? The goal of whatever this design is, and you're transforming it into a how does nature question? How would nature do something? Okay. All right, so you're thinking about that. And here's some examples that we've put down. Gretchen, you want to talk about those? There's sure, some. yeah. So, um, you know, as you practice and explore this, um, you'll notice that there are a number of different right answers when it comes to biologizing. Um, depend, you know, there's different words that, that you could use. And so um, it's kind of a critical thinking exercise, right? So, um, but our example here for the design question, how might we move water from a street or a parking lot was, you know, that you really want to break this down in terms of the functions you need to accomplish and the conditions or context in which you need to do that. And so some key things would be moving water, distributing water, like that's the end goal, right? Um, and then what are the conditions or contexts that are defined by a street or a parking lot? It's a hard surface. It may be a smooth surface or it might be uneven. There might be slopes to it. Um, so all of these are things that you know could be researched um, um, when looking for biological phenomena that have a relevant strategy. So a design biologized design question could be how does nature move water off hard, smooth surfaces or off even even surfaces? Or you can see how there could be a variety of different research questions that all could get you um, to an answer. And then here's another example. So um, how might we build a road surface that is water permeable? So um, a road needs to be durable. So the function would include creating a durable structure, right? Um, to, for it to be water permeable, that's letting the water pass through. That might also mean soaking up water. Um, so all those are functions that could be researched. Um, and similarly, like the variables and context conditions you know, would be, well, there's a lot of water, right? So this needs to work in a wet environment um, under flood conditions. Um, and so your biologized question may be, how does nature create structures that are both durable and allow water to pass through? So. so for Ask Nature, and, yeah, you wanna go ahead with that? Sure, yes. <laughs> I got distracted because I was looking at the chat for a minute, but I'll get back to the, okay. those chats. So um, one of the main resources that we have available to you to help your students answer those how does nature questions is our website, asknature.org. Um, and so if you visit asknature.org and click on biological strategies in the top menu, um, that will get you to the full library um, of um, available strategies um, in Ask Nature. Do you want to go to the next slide real quick? And so when you first um, land on those biological strategies pages, um, you'll see an opportunity to do a keyword search at the top or next slide. There's also a search by function feature in the navigation on the left. And so that's filtering. So Ask Nature is organized by something we call the biomimicry taxonomy, which is um, a um, collection of identified functions that are shared in human design goals and things we can observe in the natural world. And so all of the biological strategies that are indexed on Ask Nature are tagged with a function in that taxonomy. And Ask Nature also has design innovation examples as well, and those are tagged by the same functional taxonomy. So um, one of the ways that you can um, search um, is by narrowing down through this list of nested functions, but there you always have that keyword search option as well. Um, I will take a moment to mention that right now we are doing a major redesign of Ask Nature, so it's going to look different um, in the early part of the new year. So um, it'll have all the same features, but um, it should be even more um, easily navigable and um, I feel like I'm hearing a feedback or something on the speaker. I'm not quite sure where that's coming from, but um, um, we will have, ooh, what's going on there? That looks scary. Uh-oh, what are you seeing? Um, I saw like a video pop up that I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, it wasn't anything we shared before, so I'm not quite sure where it came I'm from. I'm not sure what that was. So can you see Ask Nature now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so anyway, just to let you know, there will be um, more um, features of Ask Nature that will enable, enable um, 
browsing and searching in a more user-friendly way than the site currently does now, but we wanted to make sure you knew how the um, site was functioning currently. All right. So I've opened up, when I opened it up, I don't know, something happened that, yeah, something weird came on. So sorry about that. Um, so this is what the website looks like. So if you, this is where you would put a, a word search in, uh, like Gretchen was saying, and over here on the side, this is where you've got the functions. And right here for that particular problem, if you click on the um, get and store, get store distribute resources, here's distribute liquids. So there's all kinds of ways that you can do um, uh, sorting to be able to find what you um, want to research, okay? All right, so if you go back, we're not gonna watch this again, but if you're doing this with students, to go back and actually uh, have them take a look at the video again and pull out the pieces that are um, looking at match where the students are actually um, doing that research and they've got these matrices of, of maybe five, six, 10 different biological organisms that they're considering. And then they talk about narrowing it down to the ones that they actually decide they're gonna select and the reasons that they select them, okay? This is another one that is um, from uh, high school. And I'm gonna show you, I think just a piece of this one. Uh, let's see. Um, they're looking at um, trying to use cl clean energy and they focused on solar. Discovered that 60% of greenhouse gases come from energy production. We decided to focus on energy and took a biomimetic approach, meaning that we researched energy innovations and living things. When we first started brainstorming, we considered many different organisms and their adaptations. We narrowed our choices down to the oriental hornet, electric eel, jellyfish, geckos, fungi, and pelicosaurus. Using the decision matrix, we determined the oriental hornet was our best choice based on our criteria. The oriental hornet's unique adaptation is the ability to generate electricity. It does so through a special pattern on its exoskeleton that concentrates light onto its yellow solar areas. We decided to recreate the hornet's yellow color and pattern in our design. If successful, our project would help reduce climate change by increasing the efficiency of solar panels, thus reducing the emission of greenhouse gases by necessary but unclean energy such as natural gas. We first thought to mimic the hornet's yellow color and place color light filters over our solar panels. Unfortunately, those from the light reduced the current produced. We then designed a solar concentrator based off of the hornet's effective reflecting and the cuticle pattern. We decided the most effective way to replicate this would be to 3D print the pattern onto a fluorescent panel. 3D printing allowed us to get us a much smaller pattern, maintaining an accurate ratio between the hornet's small epicutical ridges and our concentrator. We chose a fluorescent panel as it is effective at reflecting and concentrating UV radiation from the sun. Our initial test of the hornet's pattern turned out positive. So you can see in that one, it was um, uh, a very different level of work. So they were using 3D printers, uh, they're collecting data um, and being able to then do some comparisons. So they talk about at the end about um, several different trials that they did uh, and modifications that they made. So again, we're looking at that iterative um, approach of refining and trying to improve their design. Um, so this was a high school level one and again, there's many other in the others in the gallery that you can take a look at to get some other ideas for students. If we move on to innovate, now we're moving into the actual design cycle. So uh, they're designing, they're getting feedback from experts, or they're actually doing testing, and then they're refining their design to get it to the point that they feel like um, it's meeting the criteria and constraints that they set up at the beginning. Um, again, there's a page in the storyline on page 28 that's for getting ready and what you can do. Uh, this one's focused on the materials and also getting ready for submitting if you wanted to do that. These are uh, um, hints that are in the checklist 
that you can go through to, to get ready to be able to teach this, decisions that you might need to make. One of those decisions is actually looking at um, the types of materials that you wanna use. So you might decide if using um, CAD is something that's a part of your class, then uh, there's some resources for that. There's also an opportunity to just use uh, um, supplies that you saw in some of the other videos that are around the house, some craft materials, paper, pencil, string, yarn, paper cups, napkins, you name it. Um, whatever the kids happen to have around the house or you have at school if you're actually in the classroom. The rubric is there for you to use. The team self-assessment is there for students to be able to refer to, to guide the process. If you're interested in submitting, this would be a great time before you start the innovation to go back and take a look at the resources that are there that are talking about to submit. These are the things that you wanna make sure the teams are doing so that they're prepared to put together a presentation that's gonna have all the components that are required for the submission. Uh, if you've done the challenge before, the, the judging and the awards, or the awards are looking a little bit different. We decided we really wanted to highlight the different features that um, different teams um, are, uh, are shining on. So there's sometimes there's teams that are just exemplars in the design cycle. Other teams may be just really exemplars in the, um, the problem definition or in the storytellers. And so we decided instead of doing a first, second, third place, we really wanted to spread out the awards and the acknowledgements so that everybody could learn from the exemplars of more, more teams. So you wanna take a look at that. When you're doing the design, uh, there's a variety of hand handouts that you wanna uh, have the students take a look at. You're gonna bring some of the handouts forward from uh, in the investigate section and then you've got some new handouts, so an action plan that the students can come up with. There is a, a challenge map that they can use where they're really making sure they've got everything accounted for and that they're staying on track as they're moving through the design process. And then there's something called Designify, which goes with Biologize. So <laughs> Gretchen, talk to us about Designify. Yeah. So. Um... Another sort of unique aspect of the biomimicry design process is that, you know, once we've translated our design problem into a lens of looking to nature for solutions, when we find nature solutions, um, there's usually a necessary translation step back to thinking about them through the lens of design in order to be able to apply them. And so um, in the professional space, they talk about abstracting design strategies, but that's kind of a a mouthful and um, potentially um, um, a little bit of difficult language to use in the classroom. So we coined, we made up this word designify. So we're biologizing the design problem into um, a, design, a question to ask nature. And then when that nature has its answers for us, we need to define, designify those answers back into a design solution. So this is, it's really just describing that translation step so that we can take a biological strategy, kind of take out the baggage of um, biology specific terms and begin to think about it as an engineering design strategy that can be applied. Um, so um, an example that we'd like to walk through to kind of help you see what this looks like and practice it is um, um, starting with uh, information from a source like Ask Nature that explains a biological strategy um, sort of the first step in this process is to kind of pull out those key words and phrases that explain how that strategy works. So what are the working mechanisms? So in this case, the large ears of the jackrabbit are used to help it cool, and it's radiating heat via an extensive network of blood vessels that flow through its ears. And there's a short excerpt from the Ask Nature website there. Um, on the next slide, we've pulled out some of the key terms that appeared in that biological strategy that describe the biological system um, and a helpful strategy for then moving into this engineering design um, um, way of thinking about that strategy is to go through those, those biological terms and translate them into engineering system terms. Sometimes they stay the same or very similar and sometimes, sometimes they're quite different. So um, 
why don't you take a shot at this? We have on the, no, go back. <laughs> oh wait, yeah, there you are. So on the left in the chart, we have the biology terms. And on the right in the bullets, we have um, terms that um, describe a, an engineering system and take a try at matching um, those up with each other. Maybe toss something in the chat. So for example, um, uh, uh, hot daytime temperature, you know, how would you describe that in an engineering system? Gretchen yeah, so somebody offered the large ears is large surface area. That's correct, yes. Um, Gretchen, why don't you go? Tell them the story about what, with the large ears and the antennas. You always have, you have a funny story about, um, putting ears on things. Yeah, so well, if you go to the next, um, if you go to the next slide with the answers, so um, um, you can see here, so there's a, um, one of the other things that can be really useful for um, this translation exercise is having students draw the biological strategy as a system, as an engineering system. So on the right hand there, there's an illustration is if we were thinking about the jackrabbit's cooling strategy as an engineering system, we wouldn't necessarily, it wouldn't have to be ears, right? Like the, if we want to use the jackrabbit strategy, it's not as simple as just let's put ears on it, right? It's understanding that the blood is flowing through a network of narrow tubes carrying liquid. Um, and that is al allowing the heat to dissipate more rapidly um, and thus be cooled. Um, and so you could diagram that um, this way as an engineering system that could be translated in a variety of different ways in a design solution. And so it gets, it, um, this step is important because it gets us out of a really simplistic translation of a strategy to a design, like, oh, let's just put rabbit ears on it. That's not what biomimicry is about. It's about understanding the working principles um, that make that strategy successful and translating and, and applying that, those working systems to the design. So again, here's this, uh, another way of, of describing this translation process that we're going through. So we're starting in the investigate phase of the challenge with a how might we question, and then translating that into a how does nature question. And then that in turn leads us to biological strategies, how nature works, right? But then we need to translate those into design strategies, how we can apply them in a design solution. So then we get our bio-inspired design strategies to then create a solution from. Here are some images of teachers at different workshops that we've had uh, doing designs uh, with materials that we just were able to, to find and bring in, uh, easy to make, easy to create, these didn't take very long for them to do. Um, but just to give you an idea of what the designs can actually look like. Again, you can have very complex ones with uh, computer generated images uh, using 3D printers. So that is certainly the option. And you, we do see a number of those different types of designs. We also see ones that look much like this. Uh, most of them are three dimensional. Again, we can have ones that are uh, paper and pencil. So we have seen those also. The uh, design cycle is uh, one thing that we want to really emphasize, and it's emphasized in the rubric, is that the design cycle is a cycle. So it's not a, a linear process. So the goal is for the students to actually go through, create a design, and then um, evaluated in one way or another. So one way is to actually do some tests and see how effective it is and then do some refining and test it again and then pick whatever the best one is. Another option, if it's not something that could be tested, for instance, these that you're looking at that the teachers did and the um, design from the middle school students, those the, they did some testing, um, but some of times you can't. And so it might be that you're just getting feedback from an expert or from somebody who's impacted by the problem or has some kind of information about the potential solution. So feedback is uh, from experts is also an option that can help the students continue that design cycle 
um, and do some refining. There's, um, we call them team feedback loops and peer feedback loops. So those are documents that are, are handouts that are uh, in the resources on the, um, the educator resources page so that teams can give themselves feedback. How are we doing? What do we need to work on? How do we need to improve? And also there's an opportunity for some peer feedback. That's always important whenever you're doing any kind of work as a team. After they get done with that design process, one of the last things that you're gonna have them do is to go back to the beginning, which is, all right, so let's remember what the problem was and that we're trying to, um, to address or come up with a solution for something that is affecting climate change. And so there's two different places that you can go back to. So one is on this design um, challenge map. There's a section in that that has um, a reference to the uh, SDGs, which is the Sustainable Development Goals. There's also a question on your, how could your design contribute to reducing or adapting to climate change? So again, trying to keep them on track with what they're designing. Um, and then there's also a document that was talked about during the um, investigate part of a webinar where it is um, compare, um, looking at the sustainable development goals as they relate to climate change. So there's resources there of, that, are, that are available for you to use. And then bringing it back full circle, by the time they get done with their um, design, then revisiting that anchor question, how can learning from nature help us solve a local sustainability problem that is connected to cli global climate change? Um, this is what we were looking at today of designing that model. And once they're done with the innovation then, and they have addressed that, then the next step is for them to be able to communicate it. So how do you communicate um, what you have just done, what you've learned um, in an effective way for the stakeholders, for the community, for anybody who might be affected or for submitting to the youth design challenge. And we're gonna leave you with this quote. Young people should be at the forefront of global change and innovation. Empowered, they can be key agents for development and peace. So one of our goals with the um, design challenge is to give students uh, the tools to be able to be problem solvers and change makers um, and be able to apply the skills that they gather from this youth design challenge and anything that they face in school or in their lifetimes. And with that, if there are any questions that you'd like to ask, you can put them in the chat box or in the question and answer box. We are here for you. Thanks, Laura. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, we are available to stay on for a few more minutes to answer any questions you might have. You can also certainly email us at uh, via youthchallenge at biomimicry.org. Um, we will be posting a recording of this session on the YDC website. Um, and if when you registered, you gave us permission to contact you via email, we'll also be sending out um, a link to that recording and the checklist um, that we shared with you today. Um, we'll be sending that to you via email. And then there's also after the holidays, we're looking at several other webinars that we're going to be putting together, some of which are very uh, much more collaborative and interactive um, that teachers can get together and we can go into breakout rooms and um, bring in some teachers that have done the design challenge before so that you can really interact and ask them questions, try to problem solve specific things that are happening with you and your students. Um, anticipating that a lot of, of uh, the work on these is going to be happening after the holidays at the beginning of the year. So be looking for those and uh, you'll be getting notices about that just because you've been on this call. All right, I'm seeing some questions come in. So I'm going to scan them real quick and see what I can answer quickly. Um, um, is there a Google Drive version of the YDC lessons? We don't currently have um, the lessons on Google Drive. Everything is available to you via the Youth Design Challenge website, um, either as a link out to content that we've identified and pulled in um, as a resource or as a PDF that you can download. So if you, if you want to download those PDFs and put them in your Google Drive to share with your students directly from there, you're welcome to do so. 
Um, some very nice comments from people. I don't need to read aloud. <laughs> I'm glad you found it valuable. Um, oh, thank you for the appreciation. Um, there, I think I saw a question. Oh no, I answered that one. Okay, another one. Um, I only registered one team. If I have another team that wants to work, can I still register them? Yeah, so the way registration works is the, um, the, the educator registers and then you can work with as many teams as you want. Um, we just ask that um, if you are choosing to enter teams into the competition, in order for us to have a manageable um, judging process, we ask um, teachers to submit um, no more than three projects for consideration for awards, but there's no limit to how many students you can work with. Um, we just need your contact information um, at registration and then you share student information with us when you submit. Um, Another one, I work with out of school programs. I know that this is primarily targeted towards classroom, but is there anything that precludes non school teams from participating? Absolutely not. No, it's open for both out of school and in school settings. Um, absolutely. Um, we recognize that those settings have their own little differences and you may need to um, kind of adjust the pace or delivery in some ways, um, but we hope that the flexibility built into the program makes it um, suitable for either environment. I think there was one also about elementary, upper elementary, and um, definitely that yeah, you could do upper elementary. And remember, you don't have to do the entire um, um, design challenge. So you can, you can modify it. Um, I don't think they'd be able to submit to the youth design challenge at an elementary level, right? No, we do. Um, you know, it's targeted for uh, sixth through 12th grade and we have those um, judging Mm -hmm. bands separated. So um, yeah, I guess I would discourage submitting to the competition for much students much younger than that. Yeah. Um, but absolutely feel free to take what's useful to you from the curriculum and um, engage your students with biomimicry. That's what this is all about. And um, I did answer in the Q&A um, feed, which I, I think everyone has access to see the, the questions and answers as they were answered. Um, there was a question about um, elementary age students and I shared that we are currently working on some curriculum for K through five. It's not available just yet. Um, we anticipate doing some uh, some limited testing with classrooms in the spring. Um, if you're on our mailing lists, um, you may receive information about how to um, volunteer if you want to be part of that testing program. We haven't quite um, ironed out exactly how that would work, um, but um, we do anticipate um, by um, late next year having something more complete um, that could be a test, pilot tested on a larger scale. So please just stay in touch um, and follow follow us. <laughs> you'll, you'll hear about everything um, that's newly released when it comes out. Mm. Let me see if there's any other questions. I'm looking for up. Thank you, everyone. What a great group. Oh my goodness. I'm seeing a lot of names on here. Awesome. Well, it seems like um, half our audience has dropped off and I'm not seeing any more burning questions in the chat. So maybe we'll just take this as a good time to wrap up. And of course, if you have any additional questions, you can email us at the address on your screen and um, we'll be in touch with um, follow-up resources from the webinar. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thanks everyone.